First, let me apologize for my voice. I have a bad cold, and I suspect you'll hear it. Well, on to Napoleon. The French Revolution either climaxed or self-destructed, depending on your viewpoint, with the rule of Napoleon Bonaparte. Napoleon burst into world history as a young soldier from the recently conquered backwater island of Corsica. He rose to fame when the revolution created new opportunities for talented nobodies. As a general, he imposed the French Revolution and his own will on most of Europe. Just 15 years after the storming of the Bastille, he crowned himself emperor in the presence of the Pope. Yet he insisted to the end that he supported and indeed that he embodied the ideals of the revolution. So was Napoleon a good guy or was he a bad guy? Was he a hero or was he a tyrant? The short answer you see was probably both, which is why historians still debate this question. In your third class on Napoleon, you're going to debate this question yourselves, and I'll be there to referee the debate and to hand out treats to the winning side. In addition to your usual notes template, you have a debate preparation sheet. As you watch the videos and do the readings, write down arguments in favor of Napoleon's status as a hero and as a tyrant, and don't forget to add evidence. You don't know yet which of these sides you'll be defending. The third and final day of this lesson, we will look at these note sheets and give you a participation grade. You're going to need these notes for the debate, too, so don't blow this one off, okay? But to have a meaningful debate about whether Napoleon was a hero or a tyrant, we first need to figure out what these two words actually mean, or, to use debate speak, we need to define our terms. So, I want you to take a few minutes now to come up with three or four words or phrases that describe someone who, in your concept of this term, is a hero. And then come up with three or four words or phrases that describe someone who is a tyrant. Finally, try to come up with one example of each hero and tyrant from history or fiction. Uh, Darth Vader and Luke Skywalker, by the way, are already taken. So here are the Oxford English Dictionary definitions of these two terms, hero and tyrant. And I propose that you use these as a starting point for debate, although you can come up with other definitions if you want to. As you learn more about the life of Napoleon, think about all three of these attributes. Courage, outstanding achievement, noble qualities, and whether Napoleon met this definition. Ask yourself as well if Napoleon's rule, both in France and in the countries that he conquered, could be considered cruel and oppressive. In other words, was Napoleon a hero or was Napoleon a tyrant? Since we're ending this exploration of Napoleon's life with a debate, you've probably guessed that I think there are some good arguments on both sides. It would be pretty unfair to hand any of you the job of defending the proposition that, for example, Hitler was a hero or Abraham Lincoln was a tyrant. Although in Hitler's early days, his ability to end international sanctions on Germany made him a hero to many of his countrymen. And many people called Abraham Lincoln a tyrant at the time. He suspended habeas corpus during the Civil War and few, threw a few thousand people in jail without any kind of a fair trial. It's always worth remembering that history is complicated. Thirty-five years ago, I might have said that there wasn't much point to defending Napoleon. I went to graduate school in England where Napoleon pretty much ranks with Philip II and Adolf Hitler in the national imagination. So, any guesses about why Napoleon tended to be grouped with Philip II and Hitler, whom you see pictured here? By the way, the lion is a traditional symbol for England, so you see Hitler attempting to be a lion tamer and the lion having the last laugh, which of course it did. Well, the answer is that in the last 500 years or so, these are the three leaders who came closest to invading and conquering England. So, Napoleon doesn't have a lot of defenders in the British Isles. But, a few years ago, my husband and I visited Slovenia, which is a small country in Eastern Europe, part of what was once Yugoslavia. We were quite surprised to discover that in Slovenia, Napoleon is the local hero. To this day, there are streets, bridges, public squares, all named for Napoleon. Well, it turns out that when Napoleon defeated Austria, he freed this little country, very temporarily, from the rule by the Holy Roman Emperor. He made and introduced a number of important legal and political reforms. So under Napoleon's rule, for example, this newly established, and again, short-lived Illyrian Republic established equality under the law, 
set up a school system, founded a university, allowed newspapers to be published in the Slovenian language for the first time, and abolished many of the feudal privileges that uh, Austrian and Hungarian aristocrats had used to oppress Slovenian peasants. In fact, the Slovenians admired Napoleon so much they named their most famous wine after him. This is the story we heard. Napoleon was offered a taste of this white wine, which again is the local specialty. He took a sip and he pronounced, oh, c'est bon, which is French for, that's good. The Slovenians promptly renamed the wine. C'est bon translated into chipon, and that's what it's called to this day. You see a label here. So you're about to see several clips from a four-part PBS documentary special on Napoleon. You're going to read a short biography and some quotes by Napoleon, as well as two different historians' views. One, the views of someone who's more or less a Napoleon admirer, who at any rate thinks he was more a, uh, a hero than a tyrant, and the other uh, who thinks that uh, Napoleon was pretty tyrannical, not in fact an enlightened ruler. So with that windy introduction, let's move on to Napoleon's story. By French standards of the time, by the way, Napoleon wasn't even French. He was Corsican, and his parents had actually fought against the French when the French government took over the island. Still, Napoleon's parents sent him to the French military academy. They wanted to give him a chance. And there he trained as an artillery officer. His fellow officers made fun of him. He had a funny accent. He was from Corsica. That's a backwater. It was pretty clear that Napoleon was not going to rise very far in the army of Ancien Regime France. It was dominated by aristocrats, obsessed with noble birth. Napoleon was a nobody. <clears throat> then came the revolution, and Napoleon and other nobodies, for what it's worth, got their big chance. And we're going to pick up our video story here. Right after the revolution, Napoleon returned briefly to Corsica with the idea that he'd bring a revolution to his home island, and it turns out that the local rulers were not interested in a homegrown revolution. So Napoleon returned to France, uh, which at this point found itself at war with a bunch of monarchs who were very unhappy with the revolution and the execution of Louis XVI. Since most of the top French military officers were aristocrats who opposed the revolution, revolutionary France needed military officers in a hurry. That means officers who were willing to defend the revolution. Napoleon saw an opportunity, and as he tended to do, he made the most of it. So let's return to the video. When the terror finally ended with Robespierre following his many victims to the guillotine, the new, more conservative leaders of the new government called on Napoleon to help put down an insurrection against the Republic, led by royalists, but supported by our old friends, the Paris mob. So let's return to the video again. Here's what Napoleon wrote in his diary about this event. So what do you think? Was firing in the mobs trying to restore the monarchy the act of a hero, or was it the act of a tyrant? Napoleon would have said, does say, he was defending the revolution and its liberties. He was also turning his cannon on the Paris mob, but then again, this was the same mob that had cried out thirstily for more and more guillotine victims. Is it possible the French Revolution would have turned out better if the government had resisted the mob early on? Think about it. In 1796, Napoleon married Josephine, the former mistress of a high-ranking official who, in turn, arranged for Napoleon to get a command in Italy. There, French forces were fighting a coalition of European nations that wanted to topple the revolution and restore the French king. The French army was not doing very well. Until this young whippersnapper Napoleon showed up, he proved to be a brilliant military leader, especially at inspiring his troops. Uh, before you pick up the video again, I want you to look back at the definition of hero. As you watch it, think about whether you see evidence of heroism in Napoleon's actions in Italy and beyond. <clears throat> Oops, I didn't mean to still have a slide there, my mistake. Napoleon went on to win a string of amazing victories and earn the admiration and even the love of his people. Uh, he marched into Italy claiming he was a liberator, not a conqueror. Keep in mind that there was no Italian state at this point. The Italians were ruled by the Austrian Empire. So many Italians did greet him as a liberator at first. The Italians became a little less keen on Napoleon when he punished opposition to his rule rather brutally and when he began shipping Italian art treasures back to France. 
But Napoleon did not stop in Italy. Under his command, his forces pushed into Austria and got within 45 miles of the Austrian capital of Vienna when Austria, which was at this point the leader of the coalition against the revolution, remember that Marie Antoinette was an Austrian princess, uh, Austria sued for peace. <clears throat> I'm skipping, by the way, over a really weird and amazing episode in Napoleon's career, his invasion of Egypt. Feel free to check this story out on the full video. All four segments are in Moodle. <clears throat> Basically, the campaign in Egypt was a military failure, but a huge public relations success. Napoleon returned from Egypt in the fall of 1799, more popular than ever before. Back in France, the revolution seemed to be falling apart. The directory was out of money, and it had lost public support. The Jacobins, remember those were the left-wingers uh, who supported Robespierre and the guillotine, the Jacobins feared growing support for a return to royal power. The more conservative leaders of the directory were feared a resurgence of Robespierre-like terror. But one thing that both groups had in common is that they liked Napoleon. After all, he was their very own homegrown military hero. So some of the members of the directory basically planned to stage a coup d'etat. Does anyone know what the term coup d'etat means? Coup in French literally means blow. But the term coup d'etat usually refers to a sudden illegal seizure of power from a government, often by the military. It's a good term to know, hint, hint. At this point, the legislature was again controlled by the more radical Jacobins. So you know, France is still having some form of elections. The leaders of the conspiracy figured that the legislators would give in without a fight. But when the legislature refused to surrender power peacefully and allow a new government to form with a new constitution, Napoleon got impatient and he basically staged a coup d'etat within a coup d'etat. He marched his soldiers into the National Assembly, the French legislature. Let's pick up the story again at this point. The coup took place on the 18th of Brumaire. That's a date using that revolutionary calendar, which, by the way, Napoleon would abolish in 1806. The term 18th of Brumaire is still used for a moment when a revolutionary leader is seen as betraying the revolution. Uh, here's the cover of a Marxist or very left-wing U.S. magazine that is accusing President Obama of selling out his principles by siding too often with the rich and with corporations. By the way, I'm not defending this description of the president. Uh, I'm just showing you how the term lives on. I am, however, skipping over a really dramatic military adventure. Soon after Napoleon seized power in France, the Austrians renewed their military attacks. Napoleon led his troops up and over the Alps, a truly extraordinary feat of planning and courage. And if you remember Hannibal from Ancient Civ? And once again, the French army defeated the Austrians. Austria and then England made peace with France, and the Revolutionary War seemed to be over. It wouldn't last very long. So, once again, Napoleon returned to France a hero, and he seized the opportunity to consolidate his rule. Before we pick up the video again, I want you to note that this next segment is going to be very important to your debate. So, take notes about Napoleon's major initiatives and about the techniques he used to hold on to power. After you watch the video, I want you to pause and talk about whether at this point in the story, Napoleon seems to be more a hero or more a tyrant. Napoleon's combination of the carrot and stick really shows up in his settlement or concordat with the Catholic Church. Catholics had been persecuted viciously during the Revolution. In 1793, the convention, that is Robespierre's government, forbade all public worship and all display of religious symbols. The official policy of the revolutionary government began, became de-Christianization. Priests who continued to perform the mass were subject to arrest. The revolutionary government even came up with its own rather goofy religion, a so-called cult of reason. Many of the attacks on Catholics were brutal. So in the city of Nantes, for example, that's in France, several thousand Catholics, mostly priests, but also men, women, and children, even babies, were tied up on boats that were then sunk in the river. They drowned. Napoleon himself was not a Christian believer, but he thought that the persecution of Catholics had made people unnecessarily mad. And like French kings before him, he also thought that some backing from the church would strengthen his rule. 
but the new bargain with the church was made, like most bargains were made, on Napoleon's terms. All clergy were required to swear an oil, lo, oath of loyalty to the government. Their salaries were paid by the government, and all bishops were be, to be appointed by Napoleon, which further minimized the Pope's authority. Napoleon also, by the way, extended religious protection to Protestants, and this is really quite progressive for the time, to Jews as well. The good relations with the church eventually broke down when Napoleon imposed state control of the church on territories that he conquered as part of his Napoleonic reforms. The Pope excommunicated him. Napoleon then arrested the Pope. He was in control of Italy at the time, and he imprisoned the Pope in France. So, to return to our central question, does Napoleon's stance on religion support a claim that Napoleon was a tyrant or a hero? Well, the peace with Europe did not last very long. England declared war on France in 1803, and Napoleon prepared for another set of battles. He also set his sights on a new goal, becoming not just the first citizen of France, but a king and then an emperor. So let's return once again to the video. As you watch it, think about this question. What was the significance of Napoleon putting the crown on his own head instead of having the Pope crown him? Napoleon badly wanted to invade England and defeat France's most powerful enemy, but the British Navy stood in his way. Uh, the major defeats that Napoleon suffers, by the way, in the early years are at the hands of the British Navy, both in Egypt and again the Battle of Trafalgar. At any rate, at this point, Britain, Austria, and Russia had all formed still another coalition against France. So, Napoleon abandoned his plans to cross the English Channel and struck east against Austria. We're moving now to part three of this four-part series. Again, all of it's up on Moodle. Uh, I wish I had more time to talk about Napoleon's battles. I want you to watch a brief clip about the military challenge facing Napoleon and the way he inspired his troops. Warfare would never be the same after Napoleon. Up until the French Revolution, wars in Europe were fought mostly by a small number of professional soldiers, commanded by aristocrats. They didn't march very far, they didn't march very fast, and frankly, they tended to avoid battles. Napoleon created a huge people's army, marched huge distances in relatively short times, and it seemed unstoppable. This video clip will give you a sense of the military revolution that Napoleon brought about. So, Napoleon defeated the Austrian army in a series of decisive battles and marched the French army into Austria. But he'd overextended his forces. Russia was mobilizing, Prussia was talking about entering the war, and amazingly, at this point, an outnumbered Napoleon managed to defeat the combined forces of Austria and Russia, by the way, combined forces that were commanded by the two emperors of Austria and Russia at the Battle of Austerlitz. This was probably the high point of Napoleon's career. It's a fascinating battle. Military historians still analyze it, talk about it. Military officers study it. If you find battles interesting, check out this portion of the documentary on Moodle. Unfortunately, we don't have time to show it in class. Now Prussia entered the war. Prussia, remember, had a very strong army, of which Napoleon defeats in three weeks. By the way, this was the period when Napoleon became a hero in Slovenia when he had conquered uh, Austrian territories. So now that Napoleon had conquered most of Europe, what was he going to do with it? Let's return to the video and see. By 1807, Napoleon had made what he thought was a final peace with Prussia, Russia, and Austria. The French Empire had expanded eastward, and Napoleonic law had conquered even more of Europe. And then it began to go wrong. Napoleon had made his brothers and sisters kings and queens of various countries in Europe. And this made both the revolutionaries and the monarchists mad, not least because the other Bonapartes, frankly, were not as bright as brother Napoleon. Napoleon extracted more and more money and more and more soldiers from the countries he conquered. This also angered even the people who liked his other reforms. Since he couldn't invade England or defeat the British Navy, he tried to come up with another way to defeat England. And what he came up with was what he called the Continental System, a blockade. That meant a prohibition on selling goods to England or buying goods from England. This hurt England, which at this point was Europe's leading trading nation. But it actually hurt other European countries almost as much, maybe in some cases even more, because trade with England was important to their economies. 
when Portugal and Spain rebelled, Napoleon against the continental system, they had, uh, they relied very heavily on trade with England. Napoleon found himself caught up in a bloody civil war that drained his treasury and bogged down his troops. This wasn't the kind of war that Napoleon was used to fighting. He also encountered a force that turned out to be even more powerful than a call for revolutionary liberty, and that was the force of nationalism. Let's look at one last video clip about what came to be known as the Peninsular War for the peninsula that has Portugal and Spain, and also as Guerrilla War. This, by the way, is the first time that that term was used. It's a Spanish word. The paintings and etchings you're going to see in this video were created by one of the greatest artists of all time, Goya. Many art historians consider Goya to be the first modern artist. We are, in fact, about to enter a new age. Russia was the next country to rebel against the continental system. Remember, that's Napoleon's effort to prevent trade with Britain. Now Napoleon made his second fatal error. I would argue the first one was invading Spain. <clears throat> he led an army of 600,000 men into Russia. Napoleon actually more or less beat the Russians at a great battle outside of Moscow, and then he marched his troops into Moscow. But the Russians burned Moscow and everything else in the path of the French army. The French army, you may recall, lived off the land, and there was nothing left to live on. Then winter hit. It hit early, and temperatures fell to 20 degrees below zero. The army froze. It starved and Napoleon was forced to retreat. Out of the 600,000 men who marched into Russia, only about 90,000 made it back to France. <clears throat> Napoleon surrendered to the combined forces of England, Austria, and Prussia in 1814 after he was defeated at the Battle of Leipzig. And then he came back from exile in 1815 for one last stand. That's a lot of history. Quickly, if you want to know more, again, the whole video is on Moodle. In 1815, at the Battle of Waterloo, Napoleon suffered his final defeat. We still use the term meeting your Waterloo to refer to a decisive defeat. Napoleon was exiled to a tiny, rocky island in the remote South Atlantic. He died five years later, but the Napoleon legend lived on. In fact, we'll encounter another Napoleon in this course, but not until after you return from Christmas break. Okay. At this point, you've heard a lot about Napoleon from me, from Ms. Jacobs, and from the experts in the documentary. In your next class, you will debate whether Napoleon was, on balance, more of a hero or more of a tyrant. Note that we do not expect you to say that he was entirely one or the other. This is one of these on balance questions. So, what do we expect? Well, the good news is we are not expecting a written essay. This is an oral essay instead. In a few minutes, you're going to learn which side in this debate you're being assigned. Before next class, we hope you'll look through your notes and come up with some arguments in favor of Napoleon's status as a hero or a tyrant. Now, you know which side you need to come up with arguments for. But remember that you need to back your argument with specific evidence. Before the debate begins, you will have a chance to meet with your group and discuss arguments and evidence. About 10 minutes, not a long time. During that time, Ms. Jacobs and I will check and grade your debate notes template. We will flip a coin to see which side goes first. Each speaker should present one argument supported by evidence, followed by a rebuttal to that argument by the other side. We'll switch back and forth between sides presenting arguments. Uh, when you meet in your, in your groups for 10 minutes, you're going to want to decide what those four strongest arguments are and who's going to present them. After that, we'll have a debate free-for-all. Students can make additional arguments. They can try to answer arguments that have already been raised. But everyone needs to speak at least once to get a grade for this assignment. And to receive full points, your arguments must be supported by evidence. I will declare a winning side based on who presents the strongest and best supported case, and winners will receive a treat. Look forward to seeing you next week.